Continuing chapter seven, memory, part two. All right, so this section is gonna be on forgetting. And this statement, I really like Nietzsche's thought process and where he was coming from, because I often feel like I forget everything, but the existence of forgetting has never been proved. We only know that some things do not come to our mind when we want them to. And that's a great lead in when we're talking about forgetting. All right, so the first thing we need to know that there are, uh, there have been attempts to prove the theories behind forgetting. And actually that there are five different theories that have been uh, constructed on how we might forget and why we might forget. If you wanted to remember the five theories, think of how forgetting involves with those memories that generally will fade or start to dim them. Be sure to kind of think of the first letter of each theory almost the same way as if you was to spell the word dimmer except with one M instead of two, okay? Now, one of the most common experiences of retrieval failure would be that tip of the tongue uh, phenomenon. You, you know what that is. Somebody might ask you something and you feel it is right there on the tip of your tongue that you can just be ready to say it, but for some reason, something holds you back. This is that feeling of that word or event that you're trying to remember and it can pop out at any second. This is known to result from interference. It could be from faulty cues as well as high emotional type arousal. Uh, there's been a lot of videos on the subject, but for now, take a look at the slide. And what I want you to do is look at these different theories, that being decay theory. And this is when the memory starts to fade over time. Interference theory is that type of forgetting when uh, we have interference and it could be from the past or the present um, uh, that might distract us and make us forget. There's motivated feeling forgetting theory. Now this is those times when uh, experiences might be so painful that we're repressed and we, we don't want to recall or remember anything. So that's when those times would happen. Then you have the encoding failure theory. So this is when we're trying to retrieve uh, information that's from short term to long term, but it never got there. And finally, retrieval failure theory. <clears throat> this is just when we got the tip of the tongue action might be going on again because it's just not right there for the moment. It gets it, the information's inaccessible. And sometimes I think I go through that. I think there's a predisposition that it can be a genetic link as well. Uh, as my mother was very forgetful when she was, you know, uh, present with us. And I think I've gotten the same thing she has. So let's move on. Now, there's two types of interference. We were talking about interference before, that being retroactive interference and proactive interference. With the retroactive, that's what we consider backward acting. This interference occurs when new information is going to interfere with old information. Okay, so an example of that might come from thinking about uh, an absent-minded uh, professor such as myself I just mentioned, uh, who kind of refused to learn the names of the, my students. And you want to know why? Because every time I learn a student's name, then I forget the students that I've uh, I've had from before. So every time I learn new students, those students from the past goes bye-bye. Their names I could I won't be able to recall unless they made really an impression um, on me. So proactive or forward action type of interference, that's gonna happen when the old information, those students from the past, is interfering with me trying to learn your names now. Get it? So it's that old information that's interfering with uh, being able to remember new information. Think about this. Have you ever been in trouble because you used an old partner's name? 
<laughs> to kind of refer to your new partner, that's another way of seeing it. It happens though. So now you know you have an explanation that uh, hopefully it won't happen to you. But if it does, you can talk about this being proactive interference. Not that the person's going to want to hear it at that time, but you can talk about it being proactive interference. All right, so there are factors um, that would help in the terms of how we forget. That being misinformation effect. This is when we describe how a study in which people are watching a film of a car driving through the countryside and we then ask them to estimate how fast the car was going when it passed the barn. And although there was uh, no actual barn in the film, a lot of the people six times or more likely, well, six times or more likely was going to report that they've seen uh, one of those barns, seen the barns in the, in the film. So misinformation effect is that memory distortion that happens from misleading uh, post-event information. Now, sleeper effect. This is information that's it's just from an unreliable source, which kind of initially would be discounted, um, discounted. You won't believe it initially, but because it, it gains credibility because you hear it from several sources, it starts gaining credibility um, because it's, uh, it's something that wasn't really readily forgotten. Um, it, it got some steam and because it got some steam, People tend to remember those items, um, although they forgot that this was something that was a, probably a hoax in the first place. When we're talking about mass practice time and spent learning uh, with groups into unbroken intervals, this is usually what we call cramming. Okay, source amnesia is forgetting the true source of the memory. And then there's information overload when we're trying to take in all this information at one time and then we wind up forgetting it because we kind of overwhelmed our brains for the moment. Now culture can also play in a factor uh, with um, how we might forget. It might play in a role in how people would remember what they've learned. So in this um, particular situation, there's been many societies or tribal leaders that may pass down vital information through oral related stories. You've heard the term storytelling, where we go back to our ancestors and our ancestors tell us the story of, of where we come from and who we are as a people. Well, as a result, then children that's living in these cultures, they would have probably have better memories for information that's related through the stories than other children would. Uh, think about other ways in which culture might influence memory, okay? And then you could think about what we talk about in terms of serial position effect. That's that information that we might get at the beginning, which is a primacy effect. And then the recency effect is that list that we remember better uh, through the material that's found in the middle of a situation or when we're talking about study, what's in the middle. We tend to remember stuff at the uh, beginning. Eh, it gets waned, but the middle part of it is going to be remembered better even than the last bit of stuff that you recalled. Now back to cultural factors. Just remember that cultural practices like storytelling would help to influence how we remember information. Uh, how we um, have different practices might also help in terms of how we recall things. Think about the family rituals that you might uh, experience, like going out to eat or Thanksgiving dinner. Those are different type of um, events that's going to evoke memories to help you to recall particular situations. So now we're gonna take a look at the biological component toward memory. 
So long-term potentiation. Here there are two ways. But after repeated squirting with water that's followed by a mild shock, a sea slug that you see in this slide um, is Appalachia will release neuro more neurotransmitters at certain synapses. Now these synapses, they'll become more efficient at transmitting signals that allow the slug to be able to withdraw its gills when squirted. If we think critically, can you ex try to explain why this might even provide an evolutionary advantage for the slug? Long-term potentiation is that long-lasting increase within neural excitability that hopefully will uh, help biological me mechanism in terms of learning and memory. Two ways that it impacted is would be the repeated stimulation of the synapse, okay? That's gonna help dendrites to grow even more spines that would help in terms of learning. And then there's also the uh, release of the, um, and acceptance of the neurotransmitters within the uh, synapses. Now, Believe it or not, how much we recall and how much we forget also have to do with hormonal changes as well as our emotional uh, arousal. Stress, as we mentioned and learned earlier, can be uh, in terms of the amount of cortisol and epinephrine that we receive. And remember, too much cortisol, body doesn't do well. So those hormonal changes might increase in part in the storage for new information, but it, if it lasts too long, it'll start to interfere with our memory. So being stressed out can actually hold back you recalling different information. Emotional arousal. When we talk about flashbulb memories, we're looking at those vivid images that can come to mind that um, usually happens surprisingly or uh, during really deep times um, of emotional, well, again, stress, or there might be a tragic event, or even a happy event like at a, a birth of a new baby. It's that vivid images that's going to help you to remember. We call those flashbulb. Now, this happens with the fight or flight uh, hormones, um, and it helps our mind over and over again. But it's not going to necessarily help lock things in long term, but it does help put it into short term memory. Um, and the more meaningful a semantic, it, it, um, the more meaningful means that it will be more toward the semantic type of memory. And this is going to be an exercise. What I will ask you to do for this. This just helps you to kind of get a vision of the brain as well as memory and looking at the parts of damage that can be, uh, that would affect our ability to encode, store, or retrieve information. So what I'd like for you to do, you pause the video, of course, and just take time to go over the different parts of the brain and look at what uh, those parts are responsible for in terms of our memory. Allow this to be a study technique for you that we talked about in the last video um, to be able to retrieve this information again. All right. Now, there's times when people, unfortunately, might uh, get what we call a TBI, um, a traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injury happens when the skull is suddenly colliding with another object. That compression, twisting, and distortion of the brain within the skull causes serious and sometimes permanent damages to the brain. So when we're talking about our frontal or temporal lobes, if it's often take the heaviest hit because it's directly impacted against those bony ridges that's in the side <clears throat> of the skull, that's right here and right in here. And usually that's where the brain goes, hits right up on it, okay? Now, when we talk about children, think about children with concussions. Uh, one in 10 high school football players, they usually suffer head injuries every year. And athletes don't like to be sidelined, but in terms of what we've discovered about concussions, it can kill if it's ignored. So NFL, though, they've been uh, trying to correct 
all any misdeeds of the past and improve their ability to uh, ensure safety for football players. We need to trickle that down to the high school as well. Um, if there's any hit in the, the player or athlete even gives a slight hint that they are um, that it, it, they have been hurt in any way, particularly with a concussion, then out they go and no questions asked, no, hopefully you can still come back and play. No, that's it. You're done. We need to get you checked and make sure everything's okay. And I know football players or other athletes would hate to hear that because of their competitiveness, but safety do come first. But let's talk about what happens with traumatic brain injuries. Sometimes people might forget. We talked about the amnesia. There are two types of amnesia. There's retrograde amnesia, and then there's anterior grade amnesia. And just remember when we talk about the retrograde, it's where the person will, uh, they'll lose the memories of the times and experiences that happen anytime like before an accident, uh, but they won't have trouble recalling what happened uh, before, before, I, before that happened. They'll have no, um, issues or problems like their childhood for example but an event leading right up to the accident that past memory might be difficult for them to recall with anterior grade the person is not going to be able to form new memories everything that happened there's a movie that came out and i think it was with adam sadler and right now i'm showing my forgetting the tip of the tongue phenomenon um drew barrymore there it is where they called it a hundred dates or something like that because she presented with anterior grade amnesia she would they would meet they would go on a date and she would not remember the date okay because it was new information um that was being lost okay this could also be impacted not only by traumatic brain injury but we've seen it through diseases um particularly like alcoholism and others Now, this slide helps you to just look at and think about in terms of Alzheimer's disease. And the uh, graphics is kind of showing you the brain patterns of what it might look like um, for a person. Now, believe it or not, although we have made great strides in how we're able to diagnose a person with um, symptoms of the, uh, Alzheimer's disease, getting a direct diagnosis doesn't happen until the person actually passes on. Okay, and that's because there's some parts of the brain that we won't get to see while they're living. Um, but the degenerating cell bodies or plaques that's generated within accident and dendrites often don't show as fully as until we are actually able to do an autopsy. But know that this is a disease that's uh, dealing with our explicit and declarative memories. Um, we're able to pick up on implicit or non-declarative type memories, uh, but they're patchy, okay? So Alzheimer's is, is a quite difficult disease, not only for the person suffering from it, but for the family as well. Uh, there'll be times when a person, uh, they might lose track of time and their experiences of the past is what they live again, rather than of um, dealing with the present situation. They might develop anterior uh, grade amnesia uh, because of it, but you'll see them having issues with being able to describe different situations, um, being able to give details to particular situations. That's where that explicit and declarative memory is enacted, okay? But they might remember a story about an uh, event that they loved really a lot, and that would be more of the implicit non-declarative type memories. So memory distortions, we attempt to try to shape our memories, we'll rearrange it, and sometimes we'll distort it if it's, if it's good for us as far as being able to take it in. Uh, we'll rationalize, and usually it's a lot of, of, of us trying to make logic or making things on a steady uh, when we're trying to uh, remember or recall something. So we may tend to make corrections so it makes more sense to us. So 
we would try to shape or construct our memories for the sake of efficiency. That meaning, for the sake of the argument, I'm going to tie all the information in to the best of my ability to make sure that this fits my schema, my needs. Now, when we're talking about memory in the criminal justice system, and we do know there's a lot of holes to poke in on the criminal justice system. Um, but when we're talking about that, do you uh, remember suddenly uh, when we're talking about the study of Elizabeth, who remembered to find her mother uh, drowned body long after it happened? Well, Elizabeth's recovery of the gruesome childhood memories, although so painful, initially was brought great relief to her. Kind of also explained why she always had been fascinated by the topic of memory. So then her brother called to say, well, there's been a mistake. The relative who told Elizabeth that she'd been the one to discover her mother's body later remembered as well as other relatives confirming that it had not actually been Aunt Pearl, not Elizabeth um, Loftus. Um, but Loftus, the expert on memory distortions, had unknowingly created her uh, a false memory. Our, we can be so influenced when we're trying to make sense of things. So know that when we're talking about memory, there is a level of unreliability when we're looking at specifically eyewitness testimony. Remember, if we're trying to make things perfect within a schema, we might add pieces that wasn't existent even in uh, a particular situation. Confidence within one's memory, it, we can't consider that to be a predictor of accuracy. And we have to take in the realization that false memories do happen. Um, there's always a lot of controversy and debate around repressed memories, simply because we try to construct our memories based on what we feel we need at that given time. So how do you recall and make your memories easier? Well, one way of doing it is being able to pay attention and try to reduce that interference. Rehearse, rehearse. Repetition is a key factor on how we recall things. It helps us with the encoding. So utilize the encoding specificity. <laughs> I'm having trouble with that word again. Specificity principle. That's why we repeat it and do it over. Rehearsal, recall, remember. <laughs> but anyway. Allow yourself to try to be more organized. Um, you want to be able to manage your time. Do self-monitoring and do use mnemonics when you can. When you can. Do you use space of time, proper time management. And hopefully that will help you to start recalling. And again, remember, it's all right if you forget sometimes, but always try to have a way to recall things if you can't recall something immediately have something written down. Like I had today, for example, I had a really vivid dream and I usually don't recall my dreams and I don't recall it very long. First thing I did was I grabbed my phone and I went into notes and just typed down a bit of the information that was heavy on my mind when I woke up from the dream so that I don't forget it totally. These are different things that you can do for yourself to help you with your memory. Well, this ends chapter seven. Um, we will get started on chapter eight by Wednesday. Thanks for listening.